Hello and good morning, everyone. Only positivity here. I have my coffee with me. I'm ready to kick off podcast number 15 on this playlist that I'm looking to launch called Elevated Thoughts. So before diving into the book and everything, we'll just level set on what I'm doing here. So, you know, as I endeavor upon pursuing knowledge um, and life experience in this next phase of life um, through fitness, photography, traveling, uh, one habit that I've really formed is reading. So essentially, this podcast goes through some of the books that I've been reading as of late, taking those lessons learned and applying them to experiences in my life. So before jumping into the book, uh, I guess we can go into today's story. So, um, you know, this this story kind of has to do with uh, with me in high school. So, you know, about 10, 10 15 years ago. So um, in high school, you know, I had I had met a group of guys um, and I never really hung out with Indian people a lot. Right. I was uh, in sports and stuff like that. Orchestra. Um, I never found myself around a lot of Indian people um, as as my friends. But in high school, I really found a group of uh, brown dudes, I guess, if you'll say, um, that that I hung out with primarily. And, you know, th- we were like we were just some some typical high school dudes um, being douchey, honestly. Um, and we were like just being like, you know, just just like douche douche boys. Right. For lack of a better phrase. Um, so uh, what we would do is we would uh, we would go to these other like, you know, Indian Student Association events that would occur like on Friday nights and you know there'd be music and stuff like that and we'd go there like 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 we were some badasses right like we were the those those bad boys that walk in when you see us like five brown dudes like it's like a slow motion music video right um but what we would do is you know we would go to these things and we would um we would see like some dude who was like eyeing us in the corner we'd be like all right you know we're gonna take care of this dude and then what we would do is we would dance battle them right and that was like our way of like you know quote unquote like fighting them right it was just like all right this epic dance battle this showdown we're gonna get them you know what i mean um and like looking back at it, you know, I'm I am proud of myself that I was confident enough to like you know like dance like that. And I'm I like dancing, you know, I'm a big dancer. Um, I love music, things like that. Um, I was on on a bhangra team, uh, which is a Punjabi dance team, uh, in uh in college. You know, I've done dances my whole life, so I guess like you know it it made sense for me to do that. But um. It was kind of like uh, it was kind of like West Side Story, right? Like you know the sharks versus the jets. We would like come up, like snap into each other, and just like break out into dance. And you know whichever one the crowd liked best um, won at the end of the day. And you know most of the time it was us. So um, yeah, put some respect on my name, I guess. But you know, I mean, you know that's it's just a funny story, right? When when you're younger, when you're like you these flexes that you do, you think like they're they're really they're taken really well in the moment or um that uh, that uh um what do you call that novelty is there or the effect is great but when you really reflect on it you're like oh you know that was that was kind of a douchey move for me to do like did i really think like you know i was the man because like people were clapping for me when i was like in this dance battle but anyway just uh just a little lighthearted story there from high school right i think we all have very cringy moments um, from our younger days, and I think it's okay to to go ahead and reflect on those um, because it's part of who you are now, right? So, you know, uh, coming back, coming back to uh, the book for today, right? So we're gonna go through the last part of *Man's Search for Meaning* uh, by Viktor Frankl, right? So, like I was saying, this book is written in two parts. Um, the first part. Um, that we were talking about was going through Viktor Frankl's experience um, within the concentration camp, camp um, Auschwitz, during the Holocaust. And the second part um, goes through human psychology related to traumatic experiences. Um, so, you know, we, we've been talking about um, we've been talking about love and, you know, how that's a very good hierarchy and goal. Um, but let's talk about um, the psychology of a prisoner after they're released from a concentration camp. So the first quote um, that I highlighted in the book, in this section of the book, uh, by Viktor Frankl goes like this. It is apparent that the mere knowledge that a man was either a camp guard or a prisoner tells us almost nothing, right? So what, what this means was there were acts of kindness found in all groups, right? So although the prisoners were put in that traumatic experience, so were the guards, right? Um, like we talked about before, the guards were often, um, you know, Jews themselves who were um, selected, 
by by you know the capos and things like that and they they were like i said they were jews themselves but their their moral character um was compromised and they became guards and they became capos and they became people that would inflict pain on other prisoners uh in the concentration camp okay so um what he wants to note that even officers were kind right so there was always some form of kindness expressed in the concentration camp but what this really meant to victor frankl and he says this that um, there is only two types of people, decent and indecent people, okay? So both of these are found in all groups, right? And I, and I like this because it takes away things like um, color, uh, faith, sexual orientation, ethnicity, geographical, physical differences, right? It just brings it back to our character, okay? So he says there's only two types of people, decent and indecent people. And, you know, coming back to, to experience of mine, um, I would relate this to, you know, a lot of the shows I watch or the interactions I have. So let's, let's bring it back to Peaky Blinders, right? So that's one of my favorite shows. Um, but one, a couple characters are coming to mind when I think about this decent versus indecent type of person, okay? So let's talk about Danny Wizbang. So Danny Wizbang was a soldier um, in Thomas Shelby's um, unit during World War One, right? And he has clear PTSD. The guy's ha the guy has flashbacks. He pretends to shoot um, German infantry um, on the back uh, of milk carts with his broomstick. Um, he's he's having episodes where he runs into a bar and like tackles people and starts you know just wreaking havoc on places, even though the war is long over. OK, and we also talk about Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is in all seasons and he is a black pastor that was also in Thomas Shelby's unit. Right. So this is early 1900s when racism is very present. Right. So um, in any case, Thomas Shelby holds these guys as family. Right. Because they were there for him um, during the war. Right. They were people that were willing to lay their lives on the ground uh, for him during world war one right so you know going back to that notion of decent versus indecent people right that's that's ir that's regardless of color regardless of faith um regardless of sexual orientation but even going to the godfather the movie the godfather um let's talk about luca brazzi right luca brazzi was um uh vito corleone's uh hitman for the most part right but he was kind of like a he he's like he had he had asperger's or some type of some form of mental retardation right the guy couldn't speak he couldn't articulate his sentences well but vito corleone calls luca brazzi his most loyal friend right so regardless of any condition anything that luca had vito held him in the highest regard okay so although these guys are mob bosses they're they're affiliated with crime they make that distinction between decent and indecent people, okay? Um, so coming back to the book here, okay? So let's come back to the, the concentration camp. So Victor Frankl says that being released from a concentration camp, it would be quite wrong to think that we went mad with joy. So essentially what he's saying here is you would, you would assume that um, if you're released from a scene like a concentration camp as a prisoner, you're going to go crazy, right? It's going to be um, just fanfare. You're going to go ahead and just celebrate, right? But this was not the case. He says that as they left the concentration camp, they would walk timidly and slowly through the camp gates. And this was because they were so conditioned to being in captivity. Um, they, they were almost scared to get hit as they walk through the gates. They, there was no longer a need to duck to avoid a blow um, or, or a smack from an officer, right? Um, but, you know, like, let's, let's relate to example. You know, have you ever seen a dog uh, run through a, uh, a screen door or something like that, right? And um, as they approach that screen door again, even though it could be wide open, they, they're scared to step through it, right? You have to kind of lead them through it because they're scared right they have that you know slight ptsd from that initial tra traumatic reaction and that's exactly what was happening to these nazi camp prisoners when they were released they were unsure right they were timid they didn't know if this was real right how many times were their hopes squashed of being released how many times did they not know when they were going to be released right and now they finally are they just don't know how to handle it 
So um, going back to another quote, right? He says they had lost the ability to feel pleasure, right? And they had to slowly relearn it. And he calls that depersonalization, okay? Um, he says the man who was suddenly released from mental pressure can suffer damage to his moral and spiritual health, okay? So let's, let's, let's go back to it. This is really an extreme example of life in a concentration camp, being freed, having PTSD. But let's talk about the, the South Asian population, right, where, where, where I come from. So, so many of you listening might have immigrant parents, okay? Um, and if you don't, hopefully you can relate to this or at least understand where I'm coming from. So just let, let's try to understand this trend. So I'm going to use my parents as an example. So specifically, my father. So my, my father was born into poverty in a third world country in Africa. So he lived there and it was a, it was a war-torn area with many rebellions, internal conflicts, and, you know, rival militias and army. So he quote unquote escaped from that area and made his way to America by going all through Africa, moseying his way through Europe, um, and finally getting to Midwest America somehow. Okay. So he worked odd jobs, put himself through college, moved out to the Pacific Northwest, uh, worked as a janitor, um, and went to school uh, during the day, worked, worked as a janitor at night, right? So constantly exhausted, um, going through many struggles. How's he going to make ends meet? But, you know, if you notice throughout this story, one thing that is never present is the idea of fun. I never knew what my dad did for leisure because he never really talked about it. Um, I think spending money on leisurely activities was seen as um, unworthy, right? Seen as wasteful. Um, but um, that, you know, that's just my perspective, right? And he, my dad really never talks about the the fun and the memories that he made in college. That's all I talk about in re in relation to college, right? Like I learned some stuff, I got a degree, but mostly it's the friendships I made, the experiences I had. But anyway, flash forward, right? My parents meet, they have a couple kids, they settle down, and their lives become a little bit more comfortable now. But they still live, or they still lived as if they were in survival mode, right? That atmosphere of worry was still very, very present. But l let me make this clear. They, they never spared a dime on us, right? We were, we were very privileged children. But it was hard for them to rationalize spending money on themselves for their own enjoyment, um, because they thought it was a waste, right? And I think that's a very clear sign of that PTSD of their childhood and their upbringing coming through, right? Like I said, they never spared a dime on us, but even now, like in the present day, like I'll, I'll spend money a, a couple times a year, um, to go get a massage, right? Um, you know, I spend money on quality shoes, quality clothing and things like that. Um, because it's just a way, uh, for me to, to pamper myself, right? When you have the right things, um, you set yourself up on the best foot for life, right? But, um, they never spent that time, uh, to, or th that those resources on themselves, right? It was always about the kids, always on the house, always on other things. Um, but as of late, you know, they're getting better about spending money on themselves. Another thing though, was it was, it was, it was complicated to talk to my parents about feelings, right? Because they never had the time to work on their feelings, right? Or their emotion and emotional intelligence. All they were worried about was surviving. Okay. So I would always, I, I think that many immigrant parents in some form or other have uh, PTSD, okay? So I would say this led my father to be angry at times, resentful, explosive. Um, but like I said, once we got older and they have more free time, they began to work on themselves. And now my parents are two totally different people um, than they were maybe even 10, 15 years ago, right? Um, but coming back, coming back to the book here, okay? So another quote that Viktor Frankl uh, states is, People would justify their behavior by their own terrible experiences. Now, that's very high level, but let me ask a question uh, to the group here. Does, does anyone know someone, does anyone here know someone who uses their past trauma as a justification for being shitty now? Okay, so it could be anything, right? Oh, you know, this happened to me when I was younger, so now it's okay that I'm shitty, right? And this is why it is. Um, so, so, so I'm gonna use an example of a a glass half full perspective versus a glass half empty perspective. 
So I knew a guy many years ago who had muscular dystrophy. Okay. So he was um, a really able bodied dude. He, uh, I, we used to play basketball. Um, but then all of a sudden he start to, he started to slowly lose, um, all of his motor functions. Okay. Um, one day he couldn't walk anymore. Uh, one day, like his, he couldn't close his whole fist, um, anymore. Um, he, his typing, uh, was different. Right. So, um, his body started to give up on him, right. The muscular dystrophy started kicking in, but what I'll say is this guy seamlessly transitioned into that lifestyle, right? Um, he's in a wheelchair now. Um, but he is one of the nicest uh, people I have ever met in my life. And it's my it's my pleasure and my honor to know him. He's kind. He's thoughtful. He's a great father. Um, and he's really accepting his new lifestyle and taking it in stride. And not that... I, you know, me being proud of him means anything, but, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful that I know this guy, right? It's just a great example of how resilient people can be in life. But let's, let's switch, right? Let's switch to this glass half empty perspective. Now, um, I, I knew, a, I, there's a girl I know who, who, um, I've known since elementary school, right? We were good friends in elementary school, better friends, uh, in middle school. And, you know, we were good friends in uh, high school as well. So, so, um, in high school, um, this, this girl, right, we all started dating in high school, um, a little bit more, you know, people started liking us, things like that. Um, and then, you know, you have various experiences when you're in a relationship with someone. Okay. So, um, one summer, uh, my friend, uh, she met a guy who was older than her and, you know, she really, you could tell she fell in love with this guy and he broke her heart. Okay. And I, I think we've all experienced some sort of heartbreak and it can make you weird. Right. But um, she became bitter after this point, right? She became so bitter, um, and any conversation just turned sour immediately with her after that. Um, I had to sidebar her and try to talk to her about these things and say, Hey, look, you're being really down recently. Um, I know, I know like the breakup's happening, but, um, your whole perspective on life has changed. And, um, even, a few years ago, we met up, and she still kind of has that perspective. She's skeptical about meeting new people. Um, she's skeptical about, you know, experiencing new things. And um, and to me, it's a very first world problem, right? It's it's just work through it. Just rationalize, um, ingest, reflect, think about your problems, and move forward with them, right? And let them go. So my thought with that is, though, what I come away with that, uh, what I come away from that situation with, with is she doesn't want to get over it, right? She's she's identified with this breakup and this heartbreak for years now, right? That has become part of her personality. So she's afraid to make genuine connections. You know, she's abrasive. She's mean. Um, she would have like this these outbursts randomly. And that's okay, right? That's okay. We love people um, for, for what they are and for what they are not. But um, there's, a, there's a time where negative you have to let negative people go right if if you've tried if they don't want to solutionize they just want to sit in their misery um th that's not healthy right um but going back to the going back to the book here okay so there's a lot of people who came out of the concentration camp also finding that there was nobody waiting for them okay now this this is this is dumbfounding baffling to me okay imagine rationalizing throughout the whole concentration camp, seeing your family afterwards, right? Like, all right, I'm going to go through this terrible suffering, but I'll be able to see my wife, my kids, my family after this. But when, you, when you're released, you realize that they're not there. They might have died, right? There's nobody waiting for you. How do you move on with your life after that point, right? But let me bring it back to, to immigration, okay? And maybe some of the other books I've read. So, how many I'm gonna, uh, how many immigrants do you think came to America with that 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 dream that American dream, I can, I can have the car, I can have the nice house, I'll have the nice job, um, coming from a third world country. Uh, how many people, immigrants, do you think came to this country and realized that it might not be the case? And I can, I can tell you that because um, I read this book uh, about a year ago called A Country Called America. And it's a collection of like 12 to 15 stories um, of various immigrants coming from Middle Eastern countries to America, and this is after 9/11. So one one particular story that that comes to the top of mind is um, there was there was a couple 
that that moved from Lebanon, right? And they met in Lebanon, and um, the 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 wife actually expressed how much she loved the open the open warm air of Lebanon. Um, they had their own um, farm there. They uh, her parents were there. Her siblings, aunts, uncles were all there. She was in this amazing village um, on the coast, but. Um, they moved to America. Her, her, and her husband moved to America and had kids. Um, and they, they, they had kids and set a family up in New Jersey. Okay, but she was constantly missing her home. Okay, so now flash forward about ten to fifteen years later, they are still in a one-bedroom apartment with two kids, um, in New Jersey, and their their socioeconomic situation is in probably in fact worse than when they where they were at in Lebanon. Right. How much resentment do you think that sets up, right? Um, how much sadness do you think that sets up? But like, also, how many stories do you think end up this way, where you 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 think there's like a promised land out there, right? You're you're like, I'm gonna go there, and my dreams are gonna come true, and then when you get there, that's not actually the case, right? Couple of lessons, right? Just a just a real lesson in not setting expectations for yourself, right? Expectations when you set them and they are not achieved leads you to distress. But anyway, so re- tying those two things together, right? Leaving the concentration camp, realizing that everything you're waiting for is not there. Coming to America and realizing that American dream is not all it's cut out to be. Um, so coming back to the book, another quote that um, Viktor Frankl goes into. What a man needs is not a tensionless state, but striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal. A freely chosen task. So, in in the last podcast, I was saying that you know everybody needs a struggle, but one thing that will remove resentment is that if that struggle is a choice. Okay, so um, you don't need suffering to find meaning in life, right? You do not need it. Okay, um, but to to an extent, what I'll say is if you go searching for pain, right, searching for suffering. To an extent, that's masochistic, right? Um, and, and, and a good example for me to use is that, have you ever met someone that doesn't want a solution to their issue, okay? So, like, we all need time to vent, okay? So, I've when I have a tough day, I'll vent, right? And, and, and then it'll be done. I'll be like, okay, you know, I got it out of my system. I'm good to go. But if I find myself venting about the same thing over and over and over again, then it's my choice to have stayed in that misery, right? If I'm not rectifying the situation, if I'm not solutionizing or making an action plan, then I'm becoming kind of masochistic about it, right? Um, But coming back to that freedom of choice, right? So if we do things, that's why I feel like we all have somewhat, or I do have a somewhat of a resentment connection with my job, right? Because we need that money, right? I need that money for my livelihood. And even though I do like my job, I'm reliant upon it, right? Um, so it, it's just a real uh, a- action or a real lesson in um, asking yourself why you do the things you do, right? Am I doing things because it's what other people are doing? Am I conforming, right? Let's say is because everyone's having kids right now. Everyone's getting married. Um, everyone's doing whatever. Am I going to do it because I feel like I need to I need to keep up with them? Right, because if that's if that's the case, then you're conforming, right? Um, or am I doing things because that's what other other people want me to do, right? Is it um, some sort of societal norm that I do this? Are my parents asking me to do this? Um, you know, getting married, um, right? Right, having kids, putting your feet down, setting roots down. Um, is that something I want to do, or is it a pressure by my parents? Is a pressure by society, right? Um, just things to think about, right? Um, so I would say the older generation is is very concerned with stature, right? Legacy, having a big family, etc., right? And like none of these things are bad. These are all very um, worthwhile goals. Uh, but the key here is that do you specifically want that? Do you 100% in your heart objectively want that? Because if you do, then that goal is not going to set you up for resentment. But is it if it's if it's something that your parents might want or um, someone else might want? and you can't rationalize 100% doing it, then that's going to lead you to some resentment down the road, right? Um, how many, you see a lot of uh, immigrant fathers who turn to alcoholism because um, they they might have been forced to have a family, 
right? And now they, they weren't really ever ready to have a family, but they had it, okay? And now their outlet is some sort of substance abuse, okay? So one thing to avoid is that, right? Um, because when you have resentment, many people can reflect on it and, you know, channel it in a positive manner, but others are going to turn to an outlet to get all that out. But um, Viktor Frankl goes into um, another way, right, to find meaning in life. Um, by experiencing something, right, such as goodness, truth, or beauty. So by experiencing nature and culture, um, or by experiencing another human being in their uniqueness and loving them for that. That's one way to find meaning in life, okay? Love, love is an art. There's, there's so many stages to it. There's so many moving pieces to it, and it's always evolving. So it's a, it's a way to really and truly unconditionally accept someone, right? And it can be a really worthwhile journey because it's something you always have to work on. But let's, let's break that down a little bit. So one way of finding meaning in life is by experiencing something. And that is exactly why I'm here um, doing this podcast right now, right? That's exactly why I'm traveling and experimenting with photography, diving into fitness um, a little bit more, reading a lot more. Because um, what I realize is experiencing something is what brings me joy, right? The joy I get um, when I've gone to, you know, Scotland, when I've gone to Ireland, and I get, I get to meet new people, I get to see the landscape there, see how people live, um, see how the environment has affected them. Um, when I when I went to Seattle, um, went for a drive through the mountains, and there was just something euphoric about going through it. When I went to Colorado, going for a hike, um, just something so um, heightening about being there in nature, right? Those type of things really, you know, they get me going. They um, they get me excited for life. And there's so much of the world to explore. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't take that opportunity to explore it, especially with the resources at my disposal. So um, that's one way to find meaning in life, right? Not saying that my way is right, but not saying that someone else's way is right either. We're all just looking for um, that that thing, those things that bring us fulfillment in life. And for 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 me, one thing is also love, right? Um, not just loving my my fiance, but loving everyone who is close to me in the best way possible. Um, am I loving them without expectations? Um, am I there for them? Am I someone that they can rely on? Um, am I able to just be be a uh, uh, a listening ear, right? Not always offering an opinion or a solution, but offering it when when it's warranted, right? Or having those tough conversations. If if someone I love is going astray, do I love them enough to 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 get them back on their path, right? To let them know in in a friendly manner, in a loving manner, that they're not themselves right now, right? And um, that's that's an ever changing process, right? Because if if I don't love myself, if I'm not whole, then I can't possibly love someone else. So love is is uh, like I said, there's so many moving parts to it, right? Because like I said, you have to take care of yourself. You have to love yourself in order to love somebody else. Um, so, you know, um, this really leads us into into the next book um, I'm going to be talking about. And I'm really excited to share it with you guys. And so tune in for that next week um, because it's uh, it's all about love. It's all about how we can uh, implement best practices in our relationships with um, our significant others, but also with our friends, everyone we love. So um, long-winded dialogue there. I, uh, I hope you guys enjoy um, this podcast. Feel free to leave me any comments that you guys might have. Um, and remember, only positivity. Thanks, guys.